share a word of scripture with you this morning. I am in the Gospel of Mark again. We'll be in Mark's Gospel quite a bit this coming year. I'm reading from the first chapter, verses 21 through 28. Will you hear this word? Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded by his teachings, for he taught them as one with authority and not as the scribes. Just then, this is verse 23, just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were amazed, and they kept asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Most gracious Lord, open our ears and enable us this day to hear what we need to hear. In Christ our Lord, amen. I have been thinking a great deal this week about the man mentioned in our text, this man with an unclean spirit. What does that mean? <clears throat> Exactly. What does that mean to have an unclean spirit? What does it mean to you? The translation that I read to you this morning is the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. But I looked up this passage, specifically verse 23 that I pointed out to you. I looked it up in several different biblical translations this week just so I could get a better grasp on this idea of an unclean spirit. So I, I don't want to bore you, but, but let me share with you what I discovered. The King James Version that I know many of us grew up with, um, it renders verse 23 much like the translation that I just read from. King James says, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. I often use the Common English Bible, the CEB, if I'm looking for a like a more modern reading of Scripture. And that translation says, suddenly there in the synagogue, a person with an evil spirit screamed, screamed out at Jesus. The translation that we keep in our pews is the New International Version. And it says the man was possessed by an impure spirit. He didn't have an impure spirit. He was possessed by an impure spirit. And the Living Bible, which is not actually a translation, it is a paraphrase of the American Standard, which is a translation. Living Bible says the man was possessed by a demon. Now, Sue and I happen to like Eugene Peterson's wonderful translation, which is called The Message. And Peterson puts this verse this way. Suddenly, Jesus was interrupted by a man who was deeply disturbed. Jesus was interrupted by a man who was deeply disturbed. To say the man was deeply disturbed it insinuates that he was disturbed within himself, doesn't it? It could even
even connote that there was a like a mental or an emotional imbalance and not just a spiritual problem within this man. The, the translation implies that, among other things, the man was deeply disturbed because of Jesus, right? He was disturbed by the presence of Jesus. And truly, if we're honest, we should all be somewhat disturbed by the presence of Jesus. The man shouted, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Well, in a sense, yes. Yes, in fact, Jesus has come to, to destroy us. He has come to take us apart socially and culturally and individually. To take us apart in order to, to purge our personal and our communal bodies of anything that causes harm, of that which oppresses and enslaves, that, that which lies and manipulates and kills. Jesus comes to, to tear us down with the truth of his grace and then to rebuild our lives and our communities with love. If we don't know that, then we are either misinformed or we're not paying very close attention. If we do know it, then we, we might be, we should be, I think we can't help but be deeply disturbed by Jesus. His mere transformative presence threatens to turn our whole existence upside down. He threatens to, to destroy us, at least the parts of us that need to be destroyed. And often those are the parts that are the, the most difficult to let go of, aren't they? I like Eugene Peterson's translation. I, I like the deep disturbance he tells us about in this man. I like it because it makes me think more carefully and more profoundly about this story. I like it because it helps me to realize that this isn't a narrative about someone else. This is a narrative about me. This is a narrative about us, which ultimately is what every narrative of Jesus is about. If we're wise, yeah, if we're wise, we are looking for our own self in the whole of the Gospels, in every story that the Gospel tells, in every encounter that people have with Christ. We should be looking for ourselves. This is precisely why I'm not inclined to favor the possession of this man in our text. The, the Living Bible paraphrase and the, the New International Version that's in your pew, it says, they both say that the, that the man was possessed by an evil entity. The problem with possession is that it removes personal responsibility from the person who is possessed. If the devil made me do it, like Flip Wilson used to say, remember that? If the devil made me do it, then whatever the devil made me do, that's not my fault. It's the fault of the devil who made me do it. You get my drift? If I'm possessed, I'm, I'm acting outside of myself. I'm, I'm acting under the influence of, of whoever or whatever has possessed me. And I refuse to blame the devil for either my iniquities or humanity's evil acts. We have to come to terms.
terms, church. We have to come to terms with our own diabolical scheming and, and our own malicious intentions. We have to see the dark intentions of our heart for what they are, and they are dark intentions of our own hearts. If we don't face that truth, then we will never be called to repentance, and we can never be healed of the sinfulness that arises within us. We can never be transformed through Christ. Let me tell you something. I once knew a man, a pastor, who had a counseling ministry. And under the auspices of that ministry, this pastor asked his congregation, his parishioners, for financial support. And he got it. He got a lot of financial support from his parishioners for his ministry. One day in the course of conversation, just out of curiosity, I asked this pastor how he was using that money that people were investing in his ministry. I mean, I think some transparency is good there, right? We give to the, to the Haiti ministry, and we're very transparent about what happens to that money. So I asked this pastor, what was he, what was he doing with that, with that money that was being invested in his ministry? And that's when he told me, without mincing his words in the least, that he was the ministry. That's exactly what he said to me. I am the ministry. And then he told me that he was spending his parishioners' money on himself on his own needs, on, on his own desires. In other words, he was pocketing that, that money, all of it. Well, I felt inclined to report him, and I did, and nothing happened. Later, that same pastor was reported again. This time he was reported for having sexual relationships with multiple women from his congregation. And this time, at least, he was removed from his position. But his parishioners were never told why. That congregation was torn apart because they believed that their pastor had been treated unfairly. They had no idea, no idea why he was fired. And he was never held accountable for his actions. He moved to a new state. He started his own church. And he carried on with his ministry. Kind of appalling, right? Let me tell you something else. I severed my relationship with this pastor long before he was fired from that congregation. But one night, out of the blue, he called me. He called to tell me that he had a new parishioner, wealthy man, and there was t no telling how much money this new parishioner was going to contribute to his ministry. And I did what any of you would have done. I, I told him he, he just had to stop what he was doing. What he was doing was unethical, to say the very least. And, and it had to come to an end. When he opened his mouth to answer me, the tone and the character and the quality of his voice had utterly changed. It was full of malice. And he said to me, Either you can pay me, or my new parishioner can pay me. But either way, I am going to get that money. His voice sounded demonic to me. But, but was he possessed by a demon? No. No, I don't think he was. This pastor had a lot of good qualities. And he did a lot of good things. And the reason people contributed to his counseling ministry, because 
He had an effective counseling ministry, but somewhere along the way, he got things mixed up inside him. He wasn't possessed. He was obsessed. He was obsessed with the lust for money and for power, and that obsession was born from his own heart. To say that he was possessed is to say that he wasn't responsible for his obsession. It's to say that he was beyond his ability to choose differently, to live differently, to have different kinds of reactions with people because the devil that was controlling him was overriding his humanity. If the devil possessed him, then he had an excuse, you know, and, and it was okay that he wasn't held personally accountable. But he should have been held accountable, right? He should have been held accountable. Because maybe then repentance would have been brought about and transformation could have taken place in his life. Now let me tell you one more thing. I need to hear the story of this pastor aware of my own passions. We all need to hear the story of this pastor aware of our own passions. The cry of the man in the synagogue is a cry, a scream, a shout that we have to pay attention to. We just have to hear it. But we have to hear it coming from the depth of our own self-centeredness. Because we are all able, we all have the capacity to do great harm. None of us is exempt from impure and unholy obsessions. We have to know that about ourselves. And we have to understand that the cry of the man in the synagogue becomes our cry. In fact, it becomes our prayer, even. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Yes. Assuredly and mercifully it is so. He has come to call us to account when need be. He's come to, to make us bear responsible for our own actions. Actions that we have chosen. He comes to reveal our hearts and to show us where we need to change, where we are very much in need of the transformation that love gives birth to. He comes to call us to our highest self, to, to quiet the demonic voices within us, and to deliver us from any impure intention. So be it. Amen? So be it, Jesus of Nazareth. Tear us apart. Destroy what is violent in us. Destroy what has the potential to be hate-filled. Destroy what is grasping. Silence our maliciousness. Call it out. Purify our unclean spirits. And in your tender mercy, restore us to the image in which we've been created. Save us from our most base desires instill in us the goodness and 
the loving righteousness of our most holy.